Good evening and welcome to the first session of our Chagas Virtual Sheep Conference for 2022. Thank you for joining us here this evening. My name is Fiona McGovern and I am a researcher based at Chagas Athenry. I will also be your host for this evening's event. I would firstly like to call on our director, Professor Frank O'Mara, to open this year's Virtual Sheep Conference. At this point, Frank, can I remind you to turn on your mic and camera and start sharing your screen with us. Over to you now, Frank. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to open the National Lowland Sheep Conference and welcome you here this evening. It's not the first time I've opened the Sheep Conference, but it is my first time as director, and it's an opportunity to take stock of the sector and Chagas's role in support of you as sheep farmers. The latest published sheep census statistics from December 2020 show that there were almost 36,000 flocks in Ireland, an increase of 2% from the previous year. And sheep farming is a significant part of our agricultural industry, with more than one in four farms in Ireland involved in sheep production. The number of breeding ewes increased by 2.7% on the 2019 figure to 2.64 million ewes. Recently, we've seen some very positive trends in farm incomes, with the Chagas Review and Outlook Conference estimating a 21% increase in family farm incomes on sheep farms in 2021, driven by a strong improvement in prices and better market conditions. However, as we progress into 2022, animal feed and fertilizer prices are at an all time high. The overall objectives of the Chagas Sheep Program are to increase the profitability, sustainability, and competitiveness of Irish sheep production. Currently, the main Chagas research areas include production efficiency from grazed grass with and without the inclusion of companion forages such as clover, increasing genetic gain through selection of high genetic merit animals, understanding the altamintic resistance status of sheep flocks and adopting best practice in terms of animal health, investigating methods of finishing store lambs, in particular hill lambs. Also, Given the importance of climate change and greenhouse gas targets, we are investigating factors affecting methane output in sheep systems, including animal type, genetic merit, feed intake, and diet type. Another important feature of our sheep program is the Better Farm program. That's a key part of our knowledge transfer efforts. It connects our research program to commercial sheep farmers in Ireland. It establishes focal points for the on-farm implementation, development, and evaluation of technology that is relevant to the sheep sector. Currently, the programme has 13 participating flocks spread across the country, both lowland and hill farms, and is built on active collaboration between the participating farmers and Chagas research and advisory staff. And we're very appreciative of the cooperation we receive from the farmers involved. Participating farmers implement an individual farm plan based around evaluating and demonstrating how different technologies can improve the physical and financial performance of their sheep enterprise. The program involves data collection on approximately 3,000 yos plus their progeny annually. This year, eight of the farms are also now included in the new Chagas Signpost program, evaluating the sustainability of their production systems. In terms of our dry stock advisory program, that consists of 120 dedicated dry stock advisors, of which 70 have a special focus on sheep. Coupled with our education staff in agricultural colleges and the Chagas Regional Education Centres, our staff strive to assist sheep farmers and sheep industry stakeholders to improve the productivity, sustainability and competitiveness of their sheep enterprises. As we are all aware, the focus on agriculture's impact than the environment is stronger now than ever. Addressing the area of greenhouse gas emissions, government legislation in Ireland now states that we must reduce emissions of greenhouse gases by 51% by 2030. For the agriculture sector, uh, a target of a 22 to 30% reduction in emissions has been set. And while this can be overwhelming, overwhelming for people and constantly hearing talk about um, agriculture and climate change and targets and so on. The reality is that across all sectors of our society, including agriculture, we need to address the challenge of climate change. In order to improve farm sustainability and farm greenhouse gas emissions, 
we need to look at it using a team approach, whereby there are a series of steps that can be taken to improve efficiency and thus sustainability. In terms of our overall carbon footprint and, and greenhouse gas emissions, we can look at improving flock genetics, reducing lamb days to slaughter, and increase feed cell sufficiency. To reduce our use of chemical nitrogen, we can incorporate clover into our swards and use protected urea or low emission slurry spreading. To reduce methane output specifically, we can combine advances in genetics, legumes such as clover and other forages, offered to grazing sheep and feed additives to potentially reduce methane outputs. We have ongoing work in all of these areas at Chagas. And from the areas that I've just mentioned, you can see that there's also a very close relationship to improving efficiency uh, with, with all of these measures. So they're not things to be afraid of. And our approach here in Chagas is that we are looking for ways to meet the emissions reduction targets using a pathway of technology and efficiency rather than enforce cuts in cattle and sheep numbers. Coming back to this evening, our focus over the next two evenings is to address some of the key issues facing sheep farmers this year. As I mentioned earlier, we are facing into a year where input prices are very high, particularly feed and fertilizer. Understanding the value of these inputs and their efficient use will undoubtedly be more important than ever this year. Chagas research has consistently shown the value of grass as the preeminent feedstuff in sheep systems from a nutritional quality, cost effectiveness and sustainability perspective. The financial gains observed in 2021 have the potential to be eliminated with the increase in feed and fertilizer costs in 2022, as well as increases in other input costs such as energy. Our first paper tonight will focus on strategies within our control to reduce our exposure to these increased input costs. As a net exporter of sheep meat, we must also be conscious of the global market, and this will be addressed in tonight's conference with an overview of market trends for the coming year. While markets are essentially outside our control, being aware of market signals can help with our planning and management decisions. On Thursday night, the second part of the conference will focus on animal health aspects of sheep production. Increasing lamb output has consistently been identified as one of the main drivers of profit on sheep farms. From a financial point of view, but more critically from an animal welfare point of view, management strategies to improve flock health status, including reducing mortality levels and ultimately mortality around lambing, are crucially important. With new veterinary medicine regulations coming into force this year, we will also have an interesting and important presentation on their implications for sheep farmers. So before I hand back now, I would like to thank you for joining us here tonight, um, particularly all the, uh, thanks to all the speakers and the staff who have assisted with the organization of this year's conference. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy our conference tonight and Thursday night. Thank you very much, Frank, for opening our conference this evening. With that, I'd like to get proceedings underway and to brief you on what's going to happen over the next hour or so. Tonight, we have two very interesting presentations. Each of our speakers will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and this will be followed by a live Q&A session at the end. As viewers, I want to remind you that you can submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And you can do this throughout all of the presentations tonight. We will then have a Q&A session at the end and I will put as many of these questions as possible to each of our speakers. First up this evening, we welcome a joint paper from Michael Gottstein and Philip Creighton, which covers fertilizer and feed costs and strategies to reduce these input costs while also maximizing productivity on our farms. This paper will be presented by Michael. Michael is a familiar face to all of us in Chagas and the wider sheep industry. He has been a Chagas sheep specialist since 2007 and is currently head of the Chagas Sheep Knowledge Transfer Programme while also running his own farm in West Cork. Michael, can I remind you at this stage to turn on your mic your camera and share your screen. Over to you, Michael. Thanks, Fiona. Okay, so uh, as Fiona said, my name is Michael Gottstein, and I'm here today to talk about fertilizer and feed costs on sheep farms and strategies for reducing input costs while maximizing productivity. 
would like to acknowledge um, Philip Creighton, who helped me out um, with the presentation and the paper. So I suppose what I'm gonna talk about, a little bit on background on fertilizer and feed usage, um, how to reduce fertilizer costs in 2022, the use of concentrates on sheep farms, just one slide on building resilience into your farming system um, and then some take home messages. So just, to, I suppose, to start it off in terms of fertilizer, everybody knows fertilizer prices have increased dramatically. Um, last spring compared to this spring, we're looking at increases of somewhere around 2.3, 2.4, um, 2.2 times, uh, depending on what fertilizer type. Um, so look at big increases there in fertilizer prices. And when we look at, I suppose, just fertilizer nitrogen on its own, that's one of the ones that has really increased um, probably the most. And these are kind of the recommended fertilizer application rates here for the different stocking rates. So if we take a stocking rate here of six euros per hectare, the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that we would be recommending for that stocking rate to grow enough grass to feed those yews and to grow the silage to produce about 120 kilograms of dry matter per yew. Um, we're using an additional 4.5 kilograms of nitrogen there. We're using 66 kilograms per hectare. So as the stocking rate goes up, so too does the amount of nitrogen we use. That stands to reason. If we look at the cost that's in the next column here, so in 2021, at six yews per hectare, this 66 kilograms of nitrogen would be costing about 58 euros. This year, that's costing 130 euros. So at a farm level, if we took a, a 30 hectare farm, that's about 75 acres, um, we would have been spending last year 1,745 euros on nitrogen fertilizer, just nitrogen, not phosphorus and potassium or lime. And this year, that same nitrogen would be costing us close to 4,000 euros. Obviously, as the stocking rates go up, so if we go to the higher type stocking rates of 12 euros per hectare, last year, we would have been spending about 137 euros on nitrogen per hectare. This year, that's going up to 308. So our nitrogen fertilizer bill on that farm of a, a, a 75 acre farm or 30 hectare farm will be going from 4,000 to almost just over 9,000 euros. So look, those are stagger, staggering increases. I suppose it's well known at this stage that fertilizer prices have gone up and there's a lot of debate as to why and gas prices and various different things. And I suppose that's, that's where we're at. So what does that mean? I mean, what it generally means is that the cost of fertilizer per yo is going to increase two to two and a half times if we don't take some mitigation, uh, mitigating steps. So from a, a, a money point of view for the average sheep farmer, that means that if you, if you were to buy the same amount of, of nitrogen fertilizer as you did last year, um, you'd be spending an extra 10 to 15 euros per yo, obviously depending on how much fertilizer you're spreading, what your stocking rate is. So that's gonna have a significant negative effect on your net margin. There's also going to be issues around merchant credit. So, I mean, traditionally farmers will have a certain amount of merchant credit. That's not going to probably make do this year because you're going to reach the, the, the limit very, very early because, you know, you only have 40% of the fertilizer to get to the, the stage where you were at last year. And I suppose the, 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 the question that people are going to ask here is, you know, is Gottstein going to give us some sort of a magic bullet that's going to resolve this issue? There's no magic bullet here. Um, there's a series of options that people can take to try and mitigate or reduce the negative impacts of, of, of some of these price increases, but there's no, nothing that's going to just simply sort it out for us very, very simply. So a number of kind of key actions. So this is the first one. What do we need to do now? These are the priority actions that everybody should be looking at um, now, as, as you know, in January. Soil test where you haven't had recent results available. So anyone who hasn't soil tested in the last two years need to do that really, really quickly. Correct the soil pH. So if your soil is lacking in lime, which you know, we know that an awful lot of, of soils out there are, get that soil pH corrected and that's gonna release a lot of N, P and K fertilizer that's been locked up in the soil over the last number of years. Do a fertilizer budget and we'll go through that. Investigate your payment options because, okay, in some cases, merchant credit isn't available for fertilizer. It needs to be paid up front. In some cases, merchant credit mightn't be sufficient to buy the fertilizer. Or in some cases, the, the merchant credit that you may have, that merchant may not be giving a particularly good deal and there may be cheaper fertilizer somewhere else. So investigate other payment options, getting a stocking loan from, from a bank or going to the credit union and then paying, paying that off later on in the year as you normally would be paying off your merchant credit. Identify how much and the type of fertilizer 
that you, you're going to purchase. And what I'm suggesting that, you know, particular farmers who have used um, a lot of compounds need to consider taking a, a, a P and K holiday um, from some of the, the areas of the farm because then they can put that money towards buying extra nitrogen. Um, there will be priority areas that are going to need um, P and K and we'll talk about them as we're going through the, the, the presentation. I suppose the other one then on, on uh, what we're concerned about is, you know, will we grow enough grass with less fertilizer? Because the indications are, are, are out there are that, you know, farmers are going to spend less on uh, or buy less fertilizer this year because it's much more expensive. Dry stock farmers, uh, you know, the NFS estimates that they'll buy about 80 per, um, 70 to 80% of, of what they normally buy. So, um, will we be able to grow enough grass? Silage hay is, is one of the areas, I suppose, that we're concerned about, that we will have enough fodder for the next winter. So consider switching silage ground to the more productive high fertility areas on your farm, if you can do that. If you're a farmer who is lucky enough that can cut most of the area that they're farming, some farmers haven't got that option because they only have uh, uh, certain areas that can be mowed and harvested for silage. But if you, if you, have, if you are in that lucky position and you have some high index um, very fertile ground that hasn't been traditionally cut for hay and size, you can move there and that reduces the need to, to put out maybe P and K. Prioritize low and P K index areas for applications um, of slurry if it's available or farmyard manure after the harvest or in a lot of cases people will have put that out last autumn and it'll be there for the coming crop. Identify how much fodder is left over after this winter. So when the stock go out now in the next couple of months, see what's left over there. There's a lot of silage and hay on farms from last year. It was a quite good, a good grass growth year. So see what's left over. Keep that, mind it, so that it'll be there for next winter. That'll reduce the amount of fodder that needs to be cut. And then calculate how much ground needs to be closed for silage. So that what we're doing here is we're trying to reduce the amount of, of ground that we need to close up for silage make that extra ground available for, for grazing, reduces the amount of nitrogen where, where fertilizer we're putting out for, for um, silage and also for, for grazing. Only grow what you need. No, no point in trying to grow huge excesses of, of winter fodder this year um, when it, you know, fertilizer is, is so expensive. Then in terms of the key actions around grazing, so identify where fertilizer should be spread to give you the best response. So, you know, we all have fields that perform really, really well. Um, generally, recent reseeds will be very good. Silage ground obviously gives good re um, response rates because we're putting fertilizer out there in kind of April and May, which are the key growing periods. Um, swards with high ryegrass content. So if you have areas in the farm that are very poor, obviously they should get less fertilizer because there's no point in putting an awful lot of fertilizer out on something where it's not going to respond terribly well. If you have areas of ground that normally do very, very well, maybe put a little bit more on those um, to drive it on a little bit. But generally what we're recommending is to reduce the fertilize, fertilizer application amount and not the frequency. So generally, you know, if you're kind of going out, say, um, early to mid-March and then going out maybe a month later, do that, but just go out with less every time. So don't skip uh, an application rate, particularly in those times when you're, it's, it, you're trying to drive grass growth because there's high demand and, and relatively poor growth. Um, focus on grass grazing management as well. So um, there's lots of things we can do around grazing to, to help us to utilize grass better and to grow more grass without ever looking at the whole area of fertilizer. So reduce the number of grazing groups on the farm. So bunch up your sheep and cattle together, maybe. Um, bunch up your yos into bigger groups. So when you put out yos and lambs in the spring, generally we have them in small groups dotted around the place. So the quicker you can gather them up into grazing groups and get them going in a rotational system, um, the better that is. Um, really, we should be trying to get them to graze an area for no longer than three to five days. So in and out, into the field or a paddock and within three to five days back out, back out of that. And, and by doing that, what we're doing is, is we're, we're, we're basically protecting the regrowths and the grass is coming quicker after us. The aim there really is to have at least five similar size divisions per grazing group on the farm. If you have five divisions per grazing group, you move them around every three to five days. Um, you know, and then basically when you're coming around the next time the grass has, has grown back again. Talking about splitting paddocks and, and protecting regrowths, or many farms will have, have very large fields or grazing areas mightn't be set up for this, you know, um, five permanent or five uh, grazing divisions. So this is, is just a simple 
a system to set up polywire for reels and polywire and some of these um, plastic posts for rows. Uh, once you have a good shock on it, when you put it out first, uh, train the lambs to it and it works quite well. So they're the different heights there. The first uh, row at 20 centimeters, second row 10 centimeters higher. That's to stop the little lambs from running through it. And then 50 centimeters and 80 centimeters. And, and that works very, very well. For shorter runs there, a battery fencer will do, if you have an awful lot of that uh, around the place or you know long, long runs, you probably need a mains fencer um, to drive it. I suppose we probably need to talk as well a little bit about reducing stocking rate on very highly stocked farms. So farms that are very highly stocked and are not in a position to purchase the amount of fertilizer that they need to grow the grass, they, they need to consider reducing stocking rate. Um, so, you know, reducing your stocking rate by 10% um, could reduce your fertilizer requirement by 15 to 20%. Um, so look at what are the types of stock that you could look at there at getting rid of um, without really ad adversely affecting your productivity. Um, so dry yews at scanning, rather than hanging on to them and keeping them, you know, offload them. Older yews and unproductive yews may be sold in lamb. Yew lambs that are not in lambs are farmers that are mating yew lambs. If you've got a proportion of those that aren't in lamb, but you normally keep onto them, maybe sell them um, for slaughter. Uh, at, the, at this moment, you know, lamb prices are quite good. And then yews that lose lambs next spring, rather than fostering onto them, you know, is there an option there maybe to, to, to offload them? A lot of farmers have cattle enterprises as well, and there's there's unproductive stock on those cattle enterprises, you know, that you can reduce to reduce your overall stocking rate on the farm. And then we have, you know, farmers, uh, sheep farmers very often are contract dairy heifer rearing. So maybe talk to the dairy farmer there in terms of the rates that are being paid. And is there is there an extra payment there for the increase in fertilizer cost? You know, if you do reduce the stocking rate for this year, you know, and we very much hope and think that this is going to be a, 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 a blip this year, that fertilizer prices are, are, are very high and that they're going to start coming back uh, to a more reasonable level, it's going to be relatively easy to kind of rebuild at the back end of the year by just keeping on extra replacements. So the other thing then is to make better use of other fertilizers. So, okay, I've already talked about the lime, very important, but also, okay, a lot of farmers will have slurry. So using the, the, the low emission slurry spreading system, so a trailing shoe, um, or a dribble bar and, and basically spread it early, spread your slurry early and, and you get better results from it. So the first two rounds really, we talk about going out with, with, with slurry and maybe onto silage grown as well. Farmyard manure, if you have farmyard manure, again, application post-harvest to replace the P and K that the silage has taken off. Pig slurry and there's other organic material available. And um, if you can get that, that's great, um, but just be aware of the value of that if you're paying for it, if you're paying for, for the, the slurry or the material itself, and, and if you're paying for the drawing of it and the spreading of it, you know, we've come across cases where people have bought slurry um, and basically by the time they had it, had it paid for, brought to the farm and spread, it was more expensive than if they had bought bag fertilizer. No, that was in previous years. It's unlikely that it's gonna be that expensive this year, but just do the sums. And lastly, I suppose is clover. Um, you know, we're quite good at putting clover in when we're reseeding and there's lots of fields that have clover in there, but is it being managed to deliver that free nitrogen? Is it fixing nitrogen? So encourage the clover in recently reseeded fields uh, and fields that have a high clover content. And really that means holding off on the nitrogen on those. So there's significant savings that can be made there from kind of middle of April on by holding off with the, with the, with the fertilizer applications and letting the clover do its, do its job. It's very important that everybody does a fertilizer budget this year that we know kind of what we're going to spend. We don't want to go away, um, order fertilizer, order fertilizer, order fertilizer again, and then end up at the end of the year with a huge bill um, and wondering how we're going to discharge it or pay it, okay? So um, this is a simple sheet, uh, fertilizer budget sheet that uh, my colleague Damien Costello put together. And what we have here is you have, uh, the different types of fertilizers, so our straight nitrogens here, urea, protected urea, and can, then the compound fertilizers here, the, the tonnage used in 2021, and the spend, how much did it cost you, and then a predicted tonnage use in 2022, and what, what that's going to cost you. And that's a, that's a useful exercise to carry out just to see where, where, where you would be um, if you bought particular types of fertilizer. And that brings me to a case study, and I just go through one, uh, a farm that we did a fertilizer budget with. So this is a 39 hectare farm, so just under 100 acres, um, stocked at 10 euros per hectare. 
uh, it's a 50-50 sheep um, contract dairy heifer rearing enterprise on this particular farm. And in 2021, um, the fertilizer bill here for, for NP and K, excluding lime, was 7,563 euros. That's what was spent last year. And if we were to buy that same fertilizer this year, it would cost 16,745 euros or 9,000 euros more. Um, and that equates to about an extra 235 euros per hectare um, just on fertilizer cost alone. And obviously that would have a significant impact on the net margin of this farm. Okay. So uh, what are we going to do? So farmer has gone back to the dairy farmer and renegotiated contract rearing fees. And that's brought in an extra 1900 euros to put towards that fertilizer. The, the farmer himself is willing to increase the budget um, from the 7,500 last year to about 10,500. So when we look at that, what, what does this mean to the farmer? So take the 10,500 that he's going to spend, take the 7,500 7 that he spent last year off that, plus the extra money coming from the, the contract rearing uh, fee increases, the net cost to the farmer of the fertilizer increase, if we can get stick to the 10,500 euros, is just over 1,000 euros or 26 euros per hectare. So not near as bad as what it looked like in the last slide you know, where we were saying there was an extra 9,000 euros. But what we're doing here is we're not going to spread as much fertilizer as we did last year. And in particular, we're not going to spread the same type of fertilizer. So we're going to make a lot of savings by, by swapping around and changing the type of fertilizer that we're spreading. So this is what's actually going to happen. So what we can see here is in terms of urea, straight urea, three tons is being purchased this year. Last year, one and a half tons of straight urea was purchased. In terms of protected urea and sulfur, 6.75 tons. Last year, we used six tons on this farm. And then two tons of 18612, and that's being targeted for reseeds and low index silage ground. And last year, there was eight tons of that purchase. So big saving here on, on um, 18612. We're buying extra urea, buying extra protected urea, but cutting away back on the 18612. We're taking that P and K holiday on, on the ground where we can. We're also not purchasing um, 27,255. So we're at three tons of that purchased last year. Uh, we're not purchasing that. And there was a ton and a half of 10, 10, 20 purchase for reseeding. So there's no reseeding happening this year. Um, so we're not purchasing that. So look at the predicted cost at current prices um, is 10,498. So we're just, you know, kind of bang on the budget, 10 and a half thousand. What's, what's the farmer getting for this? We're getting 4,305 kilograms of, of, of chemical nitrogen, which is 80.2% of what was spread last year. So 20% cut, probably, you know, um, be tight enough to grow the grass. So how is, how is the farmer going to do it? And this is what we're going to do. Last year, we spread 65 tons of lime. We're going to spread another 60 ton of lime this year. That's going to get our pH right bang up where it needs to be. Every year, this particular farmer conserves extra silage, and last year was no different. There's a significant surplus of silage on the farm um, that is going to be carried into next winter. So that's going to reduce the amount of silage that needs to be made um, during the coming year. The silage ground um, already got farmyard manure in the autumn, last autumn, 2021. So we're not going to put any P and K on that. Um, we're taking a P and K break um, across the farm, really. Um, except for some recent reseeds and a little bit of very low index um, silage ground. We plan to reduce nitrogen use by 15% on each application. Now remember, our nitrogen is back 20%. Is back we're cutting each application here by 15%. Um, we're using uh, slurry then for the second round uh, on low P and K paddocks on some of the grazing area as well. So that's going to cut out some of the nitrogen, further saving there. And then 25% of the farm has been reseeded in the last three years. And that all has a level of clover in it, you know, quite a high level of clover. So we're going to encourage that clover. And basically from late April on, we're going to cut out nitrogen applications during the summer on those to try and encourage it. So that's a, a wait and see approach. We'll see how we get on. If there are particular paddocks there where the clover doesn't come on and doesn't start contributing, the farmer can always go and put, put a bit of nitrogen back onto that to drive it on a little bit. That's the fertilizer part of the talk, I suppose, brings me on to the whole area of concentrate feed. And the one thing with concentrate feed or ration or meal um, is that it increased dramatically in 2021. And, and the National Farm Survey, who have done their estimates for 2021, estimate that there was a 40% increase 
in the amount of concentrate spend on sheep farms last year. And that's as a result of an increase in, in concentrate price, but also an increase in concentrate usage. And when you put the two of those together, there was an increase of 40% in concentrate spend. And why is that happening? Okay, so firstly, I suppose it was a bad spring and maybe people were short of grass. Maybe people are lambing too early. Okay, lambing and running out of grass every year and having to go out and feed yos. Okay, not feeding yos according to litter size and lambing date. So basically putting yos all into a big pen and feeding them all the same. So the yo that lambs two weeks later has an extra two weeks of concentrates got, the one that lambs a month later has an extra month of concentrate got uh, versus the one that lambed, you know, a month earlier. So obviously a lot of meal going into those yos and that's wasteful. So really trying to split them up. But more importantly, we think that a lot of people last year were chasing a higher lamb price. Okay, so we had a historically very high lamb price, you know, and a price people had never seen before. And I suppose people start, started feeding to, you know, because they were worried that the price was going to drop and they were trying to catch it. Uh, and, and I suppose a lot of meal went into lambs uh, for, for that reason. So look at, I suppose, what I'm saying here is, and this year gone by was no different. Lamb prices for mid-season lambs are remarkably stable. When we look at, at 10 years of lamb prices, and these are 10 years of lamb prices supplied by Board Bia, so from 2012 all the way through to 2021. You can see these are the, the this is the price up here in, in, in cents per kilogram. Um, so this is five euros a kilo, where we usually be hovering around, this is six and seven euros a kilo. And you can see, you know, we've had better good years and average years, but generally they're kind of ballpark around the same. Uh, with the exception, I suppose, of, of 2021, which was an exceptionally good year. And we can see there that the prices were significantly higher. But what the prices did in 2021 was the exact same as what they've done the previous 10 years almost, is they follow the same curve. What you see here is you have, you have a high price for early lamb and hogget. And then as the numbers start coming out in June and July, the price comes down and then it plateaus off and starts rising again. As we, as we come towards the autumn and winter. And the reality is for most mid-season lambing flocks, you know, if you were lambing sometime, you know, March, which is where most people are, are, are probably lambing, your first lambs are going to be fit around the, the middle to the end of June. That'll be a small number of singles, um, you know, and lambs that are thriving really well. Generally, people wean then early July and lambs take a bit of a, a setback. And then from the kind of middle to end of July, we start we selling lambs again regularly. And most of the lambs that are sold from our mid-season flocks are sold in this period here inside in this red circle, from kind of July, August, September, and into October. And what you can see, if you look at that, is that the price goes up and down, up and down, up and down, but it's pretty stable. It's ballpark in around 20 to 50 cents of any one period of time. So putting a lot of meal into lambs to try and finish them and get them out earlier, say, try to get them out here, as opposed to getting them out here, is of no benefit to you in terms of the lamb price. But there's an awful lot of meal going in there um, to get those lambs away earlier. So I think really we need to review the amount of concentrates that are going into to, to sheep. You know, um, concentrate costs in 2021 count for nearly 50% of the direct costs. You know, to put that in context, if it was a pig system, which is indoor, you know, all concentrate, the, it's 70% of direct costs. So we're putting a lot of meal into to sheep, you know, that could be finished off grass, probably for very similar money. It would take a bit longer to get there. They need a bit of grass to get there, but the grass is an awful lot cheaper than the concentrates. And that brings me to my next slide. Fertilizer is very, very expensive this year. This is a slide that my colleague Philip Greeton put together. And you have here the concentrate costs uh, or sorry, the fertilizer cost um, in euros per ton. So last year we would have been up around here, 350, 400, 450, depending on when you purchased it. And you can see the cost of a kilogram of nitrogen was somewhere between 76 and 98 cents. This year we're down here between 900 and 1,000 euros per ton. And you can see the, or the cost of the nitrogen has increased from you know, around the two euros mark, even a little bit above it. How much is it costing us to grow grass and how does that compare to feeding meal? You know, is it cheaper to feed meal than to grow grass? And what this table here shows is it gives the response rates. So this is a, what we would consider a very poor response rate. It's for every kilogram of nitrogen you apply, you got five kilograms of grass. What would that kilogram of grass be costing you? 
the, that's something that you typically get by spreading fertilizer, you know, in, in poor conditions, maybe early February, you know, that type of, you know, um, time when we're not getting great growth rates. You'd be talking about maybe a five to one response rate. Once we start going into maybe early March, late February, early March, we're probably on a 10 to one and then 15 to one. And later on in the year, we're getting 20, 25 and even 30 to one. OK, so at these kind of response rates, what it clearly shows that even when we're paying 900 up to 1000 euros um, per ton, the feed that we're producing with that expensive fertilizer is costing us at these relatively poor response rates, somewhere between 13 and 21 cents per kilogram. And to put that in context, meal, if you buy concentrate feed, is somewhere around you know, 35 to 40 cents per kilogram. So even at relatively poor response rates, fertilizer is multiples more better value than buying meal. And the point I'm trying to get across here is that you know, some people are out there saying, look, at, fertilizer is very expensive. We, we, we'll cut back on it, you know, we, we won't spread as much fertilizer as we should, and sure, if we're short, we'll buy, we'll buy meal and, and, and stick in the meal. That is a very expensive option. Don't feed concentrates to fill a feed gap as a result of not spreading fertilizer. The fertilizer is, you know, two, three, four, five times better value, even at the current high price, than buying concentrates to fill a gap. Okay, so that's that's the point I'm trying to get across here is. I suppose my second last slide here is just in terms of building resilience. So, you know, regularly we're coming across things this year. It's it's fertilizer price. Other years it's bad weather. You know, you know, this is the time maybe to reflect on your farming system and, and build resilience going into the into the future. So soil fertility. You know, build up your soil fertility. It's not this year because it's going to be very expensive to buy the fertilizer, but in future years. But this year you can work on the lime and, and generally, you know, get the pH right. That's the first step. And then build your P's and K's. And that gives you the best um, response rate to your fertilizer. You grow the most grass. Incorporate uh, clover. So we're very good at putting clover in when we're reseeding, but also manage it subsequently to make sure it stays there. It's a different type of management to just, you know, growing grass. So you know, incorporate it, but also manage it. Infrastructure, invest in fencing, water trucks, things like that. So you can manage the groups of, of, of sheep and cattle around the farm and get the best use out of your grass, get the best utilization and protect the regrowths. Invest in high index genetics. We're looking in Ireland, we have Sheep Ireland that have, you know, a genetic um, evaluation program for pedigree breeders, which identify superior genetics, sheep that grow faster, sheep that are more prolific, sheep that have better health traits, you know, so invest in those genetics because they, they're more profitable. And then lastly, I suppose, review your lambing date. Um, we're still seeing a lot of farmers that are lambing probably a week or two weeks or three weeks too early. You know, this historically, if we go back to the 80s uh, and the early 90s, there was big drop offs in lamb price. And the earlier you lambed, you know, you were, you were chasing a, a price that was dropping very, very quickly. We're not seeing that anymore. Mid-season lamb prices are remarkably stable, as you can see over the last 10 years. You know, so lamb to grass. Don't be lambing and running out of grass three to four weeks later. Make sure um, that, you know, if you find that every year you have to go in with meal after lambing to, to keep yours going because you're running short of grass, you're lambing too late. Or too early, sorry, push back your lambing date. So that brings me um, to my take-home messages. So these are the four messages I'd like people to go home with from the talk today. So the first one is do a budget and prioritize fertilizer that will grow the most grass for you, okay? So for me, I think for most people, that's gonna be nitrogen. Spread lime, you know, really need to spread lime because lime will, will really pay for itself very, very quickly and will help you to grow a lot more grass with a lot less fertilizer. Uh, prioritize your fertilizer applications. So, you know, the things that we need, you know, if you have a limited amount of fertilizer, prioritize where you're going to put it. And the priority areas are silage. You need to grow enough winter fodder for next year. Otherwise we're going to be in trouble. And then where it's going to give you the best response. So that's your recent reseeds or you know, high fertility fields with good swards, right, uh, good ryegrass um, uh, content. And lastly, don't use concentrates to fill gaps in grass coat. Okay, if, if, you're, if your feed are going to be short of grass, buy the fertilizer don't buy meal to plug the gap because you'll spend an awful lot more money on meal to plug that gap than you would if you had bought the fertilizer. 
Thank you, and back to you, Fiona. Thanks for that, Michael. A really interesting presentation. And I can already see lots of questions coming in on what is a very topical issue for all of us this year. Can I remind everyone at this stage that you can submit your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those at the end. Next up tonight, we welcome Seamus McMenamon from Board Bia. Coming off the back of a very positive year for sheep meat and strong market prices, Seamus will give us an overview of the global sheep meat market and talk us through the trends which we will expect to see for the year ahead. Just to give you a little background on Seamus, he's a sector manager from Board Bia and holds responsibility for sheep meat and livestock. He grew up on a dry stock farm in County Tyrone and has always had a keen interest in agriculture. Seamus graduated from Queen's University Belfast in 2009 and since then has held various roles across the red meat industry. Prior to joining Board Bia, Seamus worked for the Livestock and Meat Commission in Northern Ireland and held various roles over the past 10 years. So Seamus, at this point, can I remind you to turn on your mic and camera and to share your screen with us. Now I'll hand over to you, Seamus, for the next 20 minutes or so. Thanks very much for that, Fiona. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a review and outlook just of the global sheep meat market um, for, for 2021 and the prospects then for, for 2022. Um, I suppose the first thing to look at is um, sheep meat production for 2021. There was a reduction in overall sheep meat production in Ireland in, in, in 2021, primarily due to a significant reduction in the, in the Hoggart carryover um, from 2020, um, just with the uh, the, the impact of Brexit and um, a, a very good summer in 2020 meant uh, a lot of producers took lambs out of the system earlier. And then we were, the result was then a significant reduction in what was available for slaughtering in the first half of, of 2021. As well as that, then we had reduced imports from Northern Ireland and um, they had a very similar sort of production um, story as ourselves, where there was a lot of lambs taken into the system very early. Um, so overall then for, for 2021, We've seen um, the, the total kill, kill coming in at 2.7 million head um, with reductions in, in all categories of sheep meat. So the number of hoggets killed was back by, by 12%. The number of, of spring lambs or 2021 season lambs is back 2%. And the yoke kill was trending 8% lower. So uh, if we look at the, the throughput now over the course of the year, as I mentioned, there was a, a strong decline in the availability in the first two quarters of the year with, with less hoggets about. Um, and then we had sort of a cold enough spring and, and poor enough grass growth. So it sort of slowed down the, the availability in, of spring lambs until a wee bit later in the season. Um, we then seen, did see a peak in July, uh, just to, to sort of coincide with the Idolada festival. And then things sort of steadied out and um, we, we've seen a bit of a, a strong increase there just before Christmas, just in the, in the, in the run up to the Christmas, good demand from the, the domestic and the export market sort of driving the trade there. As I've mentioned already, there was a, a reduction in imports from, from Northern Ireland, um, particularly in the first half of the year. So we've went from 314,000 in um, 2020 down to 269,000 in, in 2021. As I said, there was a there was strong demand from, from processors in Northern Ireland um, for lambs, and they actually increased their, the carcass weights that they were willing to pay to. They, they were just that keen to keep lambs north of the border. Um, for, for the year, to, for, for 2021, the average carcass weights have stayed fairly steady. Um, for price reported lambs, they were, they were 20.8 kilos overall was sort of the, the trend towards producers killing lambs when they were when they were common fit. And, and reports throughout the year sort of indicated that there were less heavy lambs in the solar mix. Now there, there was a slight change that as we moved into the last quarter of the year, which is which is, is fairly typical just as we as we move into you know the, the lambs that are maybe purchased at stores and finished by a, a second producer. So there there's actually been nearly a kilo of an increase in, in quarter four compared to the, the same quarter last year. So then the, the dead weight trade, I suppose it's been um, a, a very strong year just for sheep prices overall with the dead weight prices trending well above 2020 levels for, for most of the year. 
Um, you, you'll see there from the, the, the chart to your right hand side that the, the average price for 2021 finished up at 667 cent a kilo compared to, to 524 cent a kilo um, in, in 2020 uh, and we're significantly ahead of the, the five year average on that as well. Um, the, the strong increase in, in prices hasn't just been confined to Ireland, however, um, if, we, if we look at New Zealand, their prices increased by 21%. To an average price of 487 cent a kilo. And if you look at the UK, their average price went up by almost 30% to 685 cent a kilo. So it's sort of been a, a very strong global sheep meat market, and that's just been, been trickling down then to, to impact the Irish system. So as you'll see then from the, the average prices over the course of the year, you'll see there was there was very strong prices in the first half of the year, just on the back of those very tight supplies and, and, and peaking in April as high as seven. 80 cent a kilo, that was the, the average price paid. And um, prices sort of came under some pressure then, just as we moved into the summer, just as, as demand maybe for product um, came off a wee bit and the numbers started to increase. Um, and then as we moved into the last month of the year, there was a very strong increase. Um, just on the back of very good export demand um, with, with the domestic market sort of trade sort of holding steady. So then what's sort of been the impact in this deadweight trade like what's contributed into this? So there's been a, there's been a few things. Um, overall, just there's, there's been very tight global supplies of sheep meat. Um, and we, we'll touch on that a wee bit more in more detail later on. There's also been reduced availability of sheep due to that. Uh, less carrier of hoggets just in Ireland and Northern Ireland and the UK. So it's um, created um, good demand for what has been available. Um, there's then been the redirection of the, the global sheep meat trade just with product that maybe traditionally would have been destined from New Zealand and Australia heading for the EU market was then um, redirected towards China, the US and some of the markets in the Middle East. Um, then there was also steady retail demand, particularly in the first half of, of 2021, which sort of helped underpin those very strong prices. There's also then been a change in sort of dynamic on the EU market. There, there was a slight increase in production in, in 2021, um, up by 1%. However, there, there was a significant decline in the, the volume of sheep meat being imported back by, by 18% during the year. Um, and then this, um, this just meant that there was a, a notable decline then in the availability of sheep meat on the market. And that's maybe the one negative impact of not having imported product is that it reduces the 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 shelf space devoted to, to lamb just in some of those key European countries. And then that, that impacts consumption. And um, so that the, the lower availability and the higher prices have sort of translated into a 2% reduction in, in consumption and sheep meat at, at European level. Um, and I suppose it's just about maintaining the, the, the current consumers for sheep meat um, would be sort of a key target of ours. So in terms then of overall um, sheep meat uh, performance for 2021, as, as released in our, our performance and prospects figures early in January there, the, the value of sheep meat exports increased, increased by 15% to, to 420 million. Um, this was despite sort of a shift towards more carcass lamb. Um, in the last few years, we've shifted towards um, selling out more high value um, lamb and cut form. But then I suppose just there's been strong demand from the market for carcass lamb and then also labor issues that. Uh, on the domestic front, so it, it's it's really suited um, to, to send out more lamb and carcass form. Um, uh, as you'll see on the chart there, the EU has continued to be our, our most important market with, with value sales growing by by 15%, um, despite a 7% reduction in the volume that we sent there. There's been strong value growth in sort of all the main um, EU markets, so you've got Germany, Belgium, the Nordics, um, and, and France are sort of our, our major markets. We've also seen a, a slight volume growth or value growth in what we sent to the UK, and then a, a six percent growth in the in the value of the product that we're sent to third markets. But um, the the interesting thing there is the the strong volume growth. So it's really been driven by by sales to the United Arab Emirates, Switzerland, Philippines, and and Singapore, and the, the other markets provide a good um, carcass balancing function for the sort of the higher value cuts that we send into the EU. Um, in terms of overall volumes then exported, they were actually back by 9% um, to 69,000 tonnes. And that can just be related back just to the lower throughput of sheep um, just, just throughout the year, particularly in the first, in the first maybe four or five months. 
So I suppose now um, I, I touched on, you know, the, the, the developments um, on, a, on a global scale and, and sheep meat is, is becoming more and more globally traded product and our prices are more and more impacted by what's happening on, on a global scale. So if we take a look at um, China, they're, the, they're sort of the key driver in the global sheep meat trade. And they accounted for uh, just over forty percent of all the sheep meat that was traded globally in in twenty twenty one. Their sheep meat consumption in in China has benefited from from ASF and a switch from, or sorry, African swine fever, where people just sort of switched in away from pork towards sort of higher value protein such as beef and lamb. So there's been an increase in in lamb consumption by nine percent since twenty eighteen, um, and it's um. And, and there's been a growing uh, urban population as well, which is sort of more affluent and more access to to, to, to money. So they're they're, they're up. Um, they're 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 looking for a higher value protein and a, and a better protein. So they've they've shifted into sheep meat, and the, the indications are that they're they're not going to shift back now as the pork supplies increase. So that's that's encouraging. Um, New Zealand and Australia continue to dominate the market. Um, in China, they, they account for, for almost everything that's imported there. Now, now China is actually the biggest sheep meat producer in the world, and there has been some growth in, in their domestic production, but with just um, but it's coming off the back of a genetically improving flock. Um, but it, it's not expected to have a negative impact on the import demand. Now, if we look at the UK, then they're our, our biggest competitor in the EU market. Um, we we have benefited um, from the, the 20% decline in what they've they've exported into the EU. I suppose in the last 18 months, we've been able to displace a lot of their a lot of their orders and a lot of their products. Um, just we produce a very similar product and, and it's at a similar sort of seasonality. Um, so so we're we're best suited to sort of take their market share whenever they're they've they've not been able to export. Um, they have faced sort of additional costs and logistics of, of trading with the EU. Um, and however, their the, the outlook, you know, what they're going to have in 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 twenty twenty two for for exporting, uh, just just sort of remains to be seen. The 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 kill figures for the UK, which are indicate a lower, um, lamb kill to date, um, and that combined with a with a yo flock, uh, that was two percent higher in June twenty twenty one, which sort of indicate that they have more sort of sheep on farm. But I think there's been a few queries. Um, against sort of the figures produced, so we'll um, we'll know more um, sort of over the next month or six weeks as the UK put out their their sheep kill forecast. So then, if we look at New Zealand, then so overall the, there's been a decline in the exports in 2021, and, and the new season has cut off to a, to a slow start. Um, there 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 has been no recovery in their sheep flock, and there's not expected to be any recovery in uh, production in, in 2022. Just with um, competition for land um, from from forestry and dairy and, and some other and some other environmental um, concerns have been going on. So there's no recovery in the sheep flock expected. Um, they they have continued to redirect product away from the EU towards China and Asian markets. Um, however, there was a there was an increase in the in the volume that they were sending into the Europe in, in late 2021, just in November and December, um, just in response to the very strong prices in. In Europe, so they sort of maybe looking at maybe selling product there. So that's just something we'll have to keep an eye on just as we move into into 2022. Um, just the table at the bottom gives you a good breakdown of you know where where their key markets are. So so China's kind of almost two thirds of what they exported in, in 2021. Um, and then you'll see that they the there's also been growth in what they're sending to the to the US and the UK have increased. Um, while the EU itself is just um, back, back slightly from the previous year. If we look then at Australia, it's a slightly different sort of production uh, sort of outlook. Um, there's expected to be an increase in availability for export. In, in, um, sorry, there was an increase in 2021, and it's expected to continue again into 2022 with the OFLOC increasing by, by 9% after sort of declines due to, to, due to drought over the last few years. Um, so when China and the US are their, are their key markets, you'll see in the table below, there's been an increase just in China kind of now for 37% and then the US 20. They also sent a lot of product into the Middle East and North Africa. And um, post-COVID, um, that, that mean the region will be very uh, food service based and, and tourism impacted by tourism. So there's expected to be strong growth and recovery just in, in 2022. And that'll hopefully divert a lot of that Australian product to there. So then in terms of our 
domestic demand for lamb. Um, there, there, there have actually been declines in the value and volume of sheep meat sales in um, in the domestic market. Um, but post, it's we were coming off a very strong performance in, in 2020, um, and you know, so those those declines sort of are are partly to do with that. There's there's also been very strong competition from export markets for the product available. You know, we've, we've sort of been in a tight supply situation throughout 2021. Um, Lamb just for me, it continues to be a special occasion meat choice um, in Ireland, and, and I suppose as board beer, we're, we're ongoing. Uh, we have ongoing promotional focus just to highlight the first of lamb and, and try to make it more of a midweek meal as well. Um, now, the one positive that did come out of the, the latest counter figures was that more households have purchased lamb in 2021 than, than, than previous years. So, so, so that was that was very positive. So then, in terms of our, our outlook for 2022. Um, we do expect an increase in the Hoggett carryover into 2022, just with the, the, the spring or the, the 2021 season lamb kill tracking, tracking a wee bit lower. Um, and then we've got um, an increase in flock and one less working week. Um, so we do expect a bit, a bit more of a carryover. However, there's, there's a few caveats with that then because um, I suppose with yule lamb retention and slaughter will have an impact in that. And we've seen last spring that a lot of yule lambs maybe that had been marked initially for breeding were then um, killed um, just in the run-up to Easter when prices were very strong. Um, I suppose a key impact, just uh, another key impact just is, is the level of import from, from Northern Ireland. Just reports from there is that they're, they're relatively tight for lambs or expected to be moving into the year. So it, it, it remains to be seen if we'll see the same level as imports as we've seen last year or, or could they, could they, could they be higher or lower? We just we just um, we just don't know what to be driven by the trade. Um, and then as I said then we do expect a, a stronger lamb crop in 2022 just off the back of that increase in the yield flock recorded in the last census. And I suppose it was good demand for for yo lambs, maybe not so much for the hoggets in the in the breeding sales last spring. So we do expect um some growth in the lamb crop. And I suppose then you've got the, the lower colon rate as well. So so all the indications are we'll have, we'll have a bigger lamb crop this year. So in terms of our price prospects for 2022, I suppose we, we've seen the price coming back in the last couple of weeks. Just um January is, is typically a very slow month for for lamb sales anyway, just in terms of the domestic and the export market. But um, while, while there's sort of been this, this shorter term decline in, in the trade, we would expect that to, to, to level off um, just with the, the tighter global supplies of sheep meat um, and, and, you know, firm enough demand from our, from our key markets for, for product and, and key customers have, have been um, looking for lamb. So, um, so in the, in the in sort of the longer term, there's, there's just been a modest recovery in global sheep meat prices, or sorry, supplies um expected in 2022 so, so overall things should remain tight there's also then as i've touched on a few times the, the redirection of just the, the product coming from australia and new zealand just sort of into into other markets and that's that redirection of product away from the eu sort of facilitated our very strong prices it just it, towards the end of 2021 there's been a slight increase and it just depends what levels um what levels or volumes are coming in at and how that impacts our trade and then the uh, another key sort of call it is just the the impact just of the key religious festivals on the land trade. We we've seen the 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 increase in prices just at in the run up to Easter and again in around um, uh, Eid Lada and, and Ramadan. So and in early April this year we have Easter and Ramadan both um within about 10 days, 10, 12 days of each other again. So then in terms of our export prospects um, for 2022, China's it will continue to drive global sheep meat trade. So uh, as long as they continue and taking a product off the market, um, it, it will keep a floor under the trade. Um, we have continuing opportunities to displace UK product um, in, in key with in EU markets just with, with key customers. And um, as I touched on already, the, the, the reduced availability over the last couple of years has had a negative impact on sheep meat consumption in the EU. So it's just about trying to, to, to retain and, and, and grow that consumption level. Um, uh, there, there's work ongoing then to develop access to, to China and the US with some very encouraging um, developments just in, in the run up to the year. So, so hopefully that will continue to develop now in the, in the early months of 2022 20, and we'll, we'll, we'll see product heading to that market shortly. Um, there, there is then the potential for a slight increase in the in the volume of, of 
sheep meat that um, is um, that that could potentially be imported just um, in in 2022, and then on top of that, there's there's a marginal um, increase expected in EU production of, of about about half a percent in in 2022. So all that should it should feed into a sort of a good export demand for our product. Now, one thing that has um, been increasingly asked for by export markets is the is the quality assured status of our of our sheep meat. I suppose they they all get quality assured beef, and they're they're increasingly asking, you know, that they want quality assured lamb as well. So, so we'll continue to drive um, promotion just for the scheme to try and get as many producers into it as possible because. It just keeps your options open then when you're coming to market uh, and try and sell sheep meat and, and, and even in the things that you can say when you're trying to, to sell the product in the market. So so that's continuing to grow in importance. Um, so that sort of brings me to an end of um, my presentation. And I'll just pass you back to Fiona now. Um, and thanks very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Seamus. A really interesting outlook and plenty of food for thought for the year ahead. I would now like to invite Frank, Michael and Seamus back for our Q&A session. If you would like to turn on your mics and cameras at this stage, that would be great. A reminder for those of you at home that you can still continue to submit your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We've had plenty of questions in to date and we're really thankful for this. So Michael, I might turn to you first, if that's okay. Um, we've had a question in here on lime. Um, so just wondering, is it okay to put out lime at this time of the year? Okay, yeah, Fiona. So look, you can put spread lime any, any time of the year, really. There's no major issue with spreading lime, even if the lime stays on the, the leaves and animals eat it. Um, you might get a little bit of a scour out of them, but not, nothing major there that's going to upset anything. So it's just that there is the caveat of a lot of people will be using urea this year um, and protected urea. And, and uh, I suppose with protected urea, we're, we're kind of thinking that lime and protected urea don't interact as much and, and um, we're probably safe enough. Um, with the, there's a little bit of work still going on on that. With the urea, um, ordinary urea, really, you'd be trying to get the, the, the urea out first, maybe lime then, and you'd be wanting a bit of rain to wash it away before you go out with the, with the next round of, of, of urea. But really, I suppose the important thing for most people is, is ground conditions are very good at the moment. Um, you know, so a lot of fields are very trafficable. A lot of people won't be putting out um, fertilizer nitrogen until early March. So it's a great time to go out now and hopefully it'll be well washed in by the time we're going out with urea in early March. Yeah, perfect. So another quick one for you there, Michael, um, just regarding fertilizer and you spoke about fertilizer prices in your talk. Do you think that people should um, front load the amount of fertilizer that they're going to buy? And if they should, how much should they buy at the beginning of the year? Do we have any foreseen interest in what price they're going to be as the year goes on? Okay, so we don't have, have any um, uh, crystal ball to see where, where prices are, 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 are going, I suppose, at the moment. There's a lot of talk about prices dropping. Um, gas prices dropping, there's issues with Russia and the, um, you know, and gas and all of these kind of things. So look at what we'll be saying to people is, is buy little, um, you know, buy, buy what you probably need for your first and maybe second round and then see, we don't want people buying an awful lot of, of fertilizer at a very high price and maybe prices um, start coming back a bit and um, they'll be sorry if they have a lot of expensive fertilizer in the yard. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. So Frank, we might just go to you now for a moment. Um, we hear a lot these days, I guess, in the media and everywhere else about methane emissions and the carbon footprint of our enterprises. But how do you think sheep compare to dairy and beef and the relevance that sheep enterprises will play in regulations going forward? Well, look, the, the emissions from sheep farms and beef farms would be a good bit lower per hectare than, than dairy farms, because generally you're working at a lower stocking rate and you're using less um, nitrogen fertilizer on your farm. So having said that, though, you know, the, the targets that agriculture is given in relation to reducing greenhouse gas emissions are, are very big. And I think every sector of agriculture is going to have to um, try to minimize the emissions coming from, from its activity. And look, we're obviously working on ways that um, farmers can do that with minimum disruption and trying to find, I suppose, the solutions that work uh, best and, and maybe even in some cases save money for, for farmers. And I suppose... Some of the uh, material we heard tonight is really relevant to that. Like Michael talked about how 
you can save in terms of your amount of nitrogen fertilizer that, that you use. And look, that will directly reduce your greenhouse gas emissions and can potentially also Im improve your profits. So that's things like getting your soil fertility right so that you're making best use of the nitrogen that's that's actually stored in the soil, making best use of your, your farmyard manure or your slurry uh, to minimize the amount of nitrogen you have to buy. And um, using clover or, or multi-species swords as a way to reduce the amount of nitrogen that you have to apply to grow the same amount of grass. That's probably the first thing, you know, that the farmers should, should try to approach. And, and the second probably big thing for, for sheep farmers is to try to move your animals as, as, as fast as you can through the production system and get them, get them to slaughter weights as, as quick as you can and uh, get them slaughtered. So that's all the things around efficiency that we'd, we'd always be saying on farms. So in particular for sheep, it's good grassland management in, across the summer period. It's good flock health and um, obviously good drafting. And I suppose in the long term, it's good genetics. Uh, that won't do anything for you, you know, with your current crop of lambs. But, you know, have, having good genetics that will get lambs growing fast and reaching those target slaughter weights. So again, there are things that uh, farmers shouldn't be afraid of because they're going to improve uh, the bottom line and also directly contribute to reducing emissions. Great, thank you, Frank. Um, so Seamus, we'll just come to you there. Elaine asks a question about the volume of sheep meat being imported from New Zealand. And do we have figures on that for Ireland? Um, the, the, the latest figures that we have probably take us up to the end of November. And we, we imported about just over 100 tonne or thereabouts. Um, now that's a bit of an increase from last year. Um, but most of that was imported maybe in the first half of the year, just when we were very short of, short of sheep meat. But if you look at, you know, the overall volumes of sheep meat that have been imported from all markets, um, they, they've actually declined. So um, there's, we're more or less important every year in, in around that 6,000 tonne mark. So it's just been a bit of a shift in where it's coming from, but no increase in the, in the volume. OK, that's interesting to know. I suppose sticking with a similar trend, Adrian asked us the question in relation to the volume of sheep meat or getting our meat to the USA and China. And what stage are we at with this? Uh, well, as I, as I touched on in my presentation there, there there's sort of been, been developments with getting access to both markets. Um, which was it last September? We, we seen the signing of the, the protocol between the, the minister, um, the Irish minister and the Chinese minister. Um, and then that sort of paved the way for access. And then if you look at the US then, um, they, they lifted their ban on EU, um, on EU sheep meat in, um, in December. Um, so I suppose that the next stages of access are just um, technical stages just between the Department of Agriculture and, and just the, the, the governments in both, um, in both regions or the officials. Um, so, so we we are hoping to have product in both markets at the end of the year, and we we do have plans in place, sort of to, to hit the ground running in terms of promotional activity, once we can get product into the markets. Great, that's really positive news for all of us in the sheep sector. Uh, Michael, we might just come back to you there. So, we have had quite a number of questions in in relation to clover and managing clover. Um, just I suppose in a few short words, as we are pushing a little bit on time. How do you manage clover in your sword or what are your top tips for that? Yeah, okay. So look at, I suppose, clover is, is the type of plant that um, needs to be grazed regularly and, and tightly. And um, I suppose the other thing really is that we want to try and avoid um, putting an awful lot of nitrogen on it, fertilizer nitrogen. So really, I suppose, our tip from for, for the clover is to, to start cutting back on, on your fertilizer nitrogen inputs um, from kind of mid to late April on, and and then you know that'll encourage the clover to come through, and then graze it regularly, you know every three to four weeks. It'll depend on your rotation, 25, 26 days, um, and and um, that kind of generally promotes it and encourages it. Um, Fiona. Yeah. Perfect. And just another one there on the clover, Michael. So, what percentage of clover establishment is needed to fix nitrogen within the sword? Yeah, so generally, I suppose when we're when we're reseeding, we're probably talking about in, putting in about a kilo and a half or two kilos of, of seed um, per, per acre. And then I suppose look at the, the percentage of clover that you'd want to be seeing in the sward from Philip's work here in Athenry, about 20% during the main grazing season. So it'll be a bit higher, a bit lower early on, a bit higher in midsummer. And generally what that's doing here in, in Athenry in the trials 
um, is it's, it's fixing about 50, 55 kilograms of nitrogen. So we're getting the same production from the, the Clover swords with 90 kilograms of nitrogen than we are from, from the other swords with 145 kilograms of nitrogen. Great, thanks, Michael. So Seamus, I'm going to throw a few quick fire questions back to you, if you don't mind. Um, currently, the quality assurance bonus is not enough. And I suppose John poses the question, can this be addressed or improved as we go forward? Um, I suppose the, the level of the, the quality assurance bonus is, is sort of dictated by the market. And, you know, we, we, we have been um, uh, sort of um, in, in discussions with the processors, you know, but we're, we're looking at the, the level of it. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's driven by, by what the processors are willing to pay for it. And it's not something that we get that we can get involved in as, as a commercial sort of thing. Um, now, as I've touched on, the QA does increase the, the market potential of Irish lamb and it does does increase the range of markets open to us. Um, and, and increasingly, customers or and big customers in markets are coming back asking us about the sustainability credentials of our of our sheep meat and just being able to prove that. And, and the quality assurance just gives you the the sort of wagon to be able to to say that and, and gives you um gives you more of what you can say in the market. Just under under EU state aid rules, you're you're a bit more limited in what you can say. You know, sell an Irish product over, for example, French product. But if it's quality assured, you can you can call out that it's quality assured Irish. Um, so it just increases the the marketability and really what we can say when we're when we're pushing a product. Um, so 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 QA while well, they understand that the that, that people have their frustrations and that, like, we're not involved in setting the level of the the bonus but it's just a, a really useful tool for us whenever we're out in the markets trying to sell lamb and if, if you look at um, China for example there's a big interest in sustainability and you know there there could be asks down the line for 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 all QA product. Yes I suppose following on for that Frank asks a question about the demand for quality short organic lamb specifically. Um, I suppose we, we, we've seen strong growth in, in just organic for all, all categories. And we've seen, um, I think, what, 8 9% growth in, in some of the actual markets just for organic. Um, now, most of our lamb, it, it, it's still a very sort of niche niche product. We, we only get about, what, 15,000, 16,000 organic lambs a year. Um, now, now, one thing has helped is the key pack of sort of killing um, organic lambs, which has, you know, created a bit more of a demand for the, for the lamb. Um, and most of our lambs, some of it is marketed domestically, about maybe 25, 30%, and, and most of the rest of the organic lamb ends up in, in, in Germany, um, mostly, and, and some into Belgium. Um, I suppose it's, it, it is a strong market outlet, but it's, um, it's just um, difficult to grow. It's a, it's a seasonal product, and there's some resistance from some of the big retailers here, um, like they all stock organic beef. But just the seasonality of supply of organic lamb creates an issue then when you when you're dealing with with retailers. So there is there is growing demand for it there. Um, it's just it, it just doesn't have the scale as yet just to get a big a big retail order. Okay, so Michael, we might just throw a last question over to you. Um, we've been lucky this winter that we've had good grass growth over the winter, and especially where paddocks were closed up early, there's nice covers of grass on the farms. But should they be grazed before fertilizer is put out, or would you recommend to go with the early nitrogen? Yeah, okay, that's a very good question. And and I, I suppose it's a question that a lot of farmers are, are asking. We've had, had, as you said, very good growth and farmers are going to go out. I suppose the, the, the temptation is maybe if you have an awful lot of the farm, very, very heavy to get out there and start grazing. If it's a proportion of the farm, um, going out with the fertilizer maybe, and and then at least you have something there ready to grow um, once the stock goes out on it. Like So I think it depends on, on your farm situation. In general, I think this time, uh, this year with the price we have for fertilizers, you know, um, Historically, people would have maybe put out a lot of fertilizer um, in a, a blanket spread it. And I, I, I suppose this year, because it's so expensive, we'd be more targeting paddocks as we're going along um, and sparing in the fertilizer. So I'd say it's, it's, a, it's a suck it and see approach really for everybody to go along and see how, how much grass they have. If you have an awful lot of heavy covers um, and you, you drive them on, you could probably end up with an awful lot of very heavy grass um, ahead of you if you don't. If you have a proportion of heavy covers and a proportion of medium and light covers, um, then you can probably start um, going out and, and, and spreading those heavy covers before you graze, yeah. 
Yeah, very much a year for itself to start with 2022 anyway. Um, Seamus, just a quick one back to you there from Adrian. So the max price per kilo that a lamb can achieve before it becomes too expensive as a protein source? I suppose it's it's impossible to say. Like if you had asked me two years ago that lamb would have been selling at 780, 7.98 kilo um in the spring. Um, you know, you would have said it wasn't it, it just wasn't possible and that the market would push back. Um you know, you know, it's impossible to predict price. Like it's going to be supply, supply and um, demand driven. Now, the one thing we have seen this year, just in, on the domestic market, is just um, a decline in the in the value and volume of, of sales, and and that has partly been due to the higher retail price. Um, so there there is a wee bit of um, pushback from from consumers just at the strong prices, and 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 really, what's holding the strong price up at the minute is just lack of um, lack of product. Yeah, no, that's fair enough, Seamus. And I suppose just from a domestic point of view, what do you think we can do even as farmers to try and promote or increase domestic consumption of lamb? Um, so I suppose the thing about lamb is, is um, it, it, like it, it's mostly out as like an occasion meal. Um, you know, like people buy it for their Sunday dinner and, you know, or for a special occasion or for a weekend treat type, type thing. And, and it is an expensive protein just when you compare it to some of the other the other proteins. Now we did see, like, whenever COVID came in, there there was a good, like, a, a strong increase in the number of lambs or the volume of lamb that was being sold through retail. Um, so uh, th there is an appetite for lamb there. It's just uh, people don't tend to eat it um, as often as other proteins. Now, now some insights work that we have done have indicated that younger people are um are very willing to try sort of new products and and to switch back into lamb. Um, but it's, but I suppose the the price there is a is a barrier. Um, and just even the, the type of cut that they're they're looking for, um, you know, we we've continued our, our sort of quality mark promotions just on the domestic market. You know, you'll see that on the TV and social media and uh, and things like that. So, um, and we're also looking at highlighting the health benefits of lamb, um, just as opposed to to other proteins, and and just um, and then building just on, you know, the versatility of it as a product. You know, you, you can use that like a cheaper lamb cut for a midweek meal or, or put it in a slow cooker or something like that. So. So the more we can do to promote it as a, as a midweek meal rather than just an occasion product um, will, will help drive domestic sales. Yeah, so highlighting the positivity of the product we produce for everybody. Michael, yeah. just the very last question there to you. So you mentioned at the start your talk about taking a P&K holiday for 2022. This is unusual advice maybe for farmers. What are the risks of doing this, especially if you have receded ground? Yeah. Okay. And and look at I, I suppose a lot of my colleagues will probably be saying you know um, on the soil fertility side we shouldn't be advocating a P and K holiday and 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 I, I suppose my rationale for doing that is that if somebody is limited um, in terms of fertilizer budget so if your budget is for example a thousand euros you will you will buy twice as much nitrogen um, straight nitrogen as urea or protected urea with a thousand euros than you will with a compound and you'll grow more grass so where somebody is very tight for nitrogen is worried about the amount of grass they're going to grow concentrating on the nitrogen will give them you know you'll grow more grass with straight nitrogen than you will with a compound um, or like I suppose the argument I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put forward is 500 kilograms of nitrogen will grow more grass than 250 kilograms of nitrogen covered with a P&K um, compound. So that's where I'm, I'm coming from on that. Obviously, if you have reseeds, which you've spent a lot of money putting in um, that are low in P and K, if you don't give those P and K, um, the rye grasses and clovers are going to die out. So you have to prioritize those. And I, I've kind of said that in my talk, really, we should be prioritizing, um, you know, certain areas. So a silage ground that's very low will probably need a little a bit um, reseeds will need a bit of PNK, but the general, I suppose, uh, maintenance PNK that we're putting out there, um, that's probably where some ground can be made up where people cannot afford to buy the full complement of fertilizer and are worried about the amount of grass they're going to grow. So it's not the year for for trying to build soil fertility because fertilizer is so expensive. And what we're trying to do this year is get through the year, grow enough grass to feed the stock and, and make enough silage. Perfect. Thanks, Michael. So I guess at this stage, as we have ran over time, um, I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in. And I sincerely apologize if we weren't able to get to your question within the allotted time. We will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible by getting back to people individually. 
Um, but I do want to remind people, <clears throat> excuse me, that there are also um, Chagas daily technical articles which are put out once a fortnight, so every Tuesday on the Chagas website. And these are dealing with a lot of the timely or pertinent issues at the moment, including, you know, concentrate usage on farms and fertilizer outputs, how we can manage clover in our swords and maximize our animal output from using clover in our swords. So please do keep in touch with the Chagas website and you'll get a lot of information there also. Um, we also have a Chagas Sheep podcast, Ovicast, which goes out weekly. So it's something nice to listen to as you're driving along maybe, but there's a lot of technical information in that also. Um, on behalf of our organizing committee, I would like to sincerely thank everyone for joining our conference tonight and especially to Frank, Michael and Seamus for their contributions. I'd like to remind everyone that this is only the first session of our conference. Um, we're back with you again for session two on Thursday evening at eight o'clock where we have two papers covering practical tips to reduce lamb mortality on your farm and also an overview of the new veterinary medicine regulations which are coming into force for all farmers this year. And I suppose for us as sheep farmers, it's the end of January and the beginning of June that we need to be most aware of there. If you have missed anything or would like to watch back, the recording of the conference will be available on the Chagas website, so www.chagas.ie along with our proceedings from tonight's conference. So not only did our speakers prepare presentations for you tonight, they also prepared papers which contain all of the information from their talks. And this is available as a PDF on the Chagas website. So well worth downloading for some future reading. Um, many thanks to everybody. And I hope to see you all back again on Thursday night. Slán Lath. <laughs>